Hello, hello. Me again. You guys again. Uh, welcome to the Art of Stanton panel. Um, they're going to show off some cool stuff and talk through some of the technical things that they've done to get there. Um, universe, obviously, in Star Citizen is absolutely huge. It's got a vast amount of diverse, uh, with quotations over that, star systems. Um, each planet and system is absolutely crafted with a purpose and with some history and with intent. Uh, this presentation will take you through some of the process and some of the challenges, as well as a demonstration of the tools in them crafting part of the Stanton system. It's pretty cool. So please let me welcome uh, Pascal Muller, senior environment artist from the German office. Get out of here, Pascal. Uh, we have Ian Leyland, our environment art director, based out of UK. And we have Michelle Cooper, lead environment artist out of the German office. You have to click. Nice chair. Hello. All right. Hello. How are we all doing? All okay? Okay. Did we want to share the right screen? All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about art. Um, out of curiosity, who's been to like the UK or the the German studio and done like a back visit and heard us talk about some art before? Anyone? All right. So you might have heard a bit of this before, um, but hopefully there'll be some new stuff in there. Okay. So let's talk about art from the heart. Uh, all right, okay. So we've been working on the Stanton system for a little bit. Um, and what I want to do is we'll, we'll actually go through. Um, that, that's me, that's Michelle, and that's Pascal. Check that owl out. It's <laughs> a sweet owl. Okay, so I want this panel just to focus on the landscapes. So, you know, within a system, you're going to have quite a quite a variety of locations, you know, space stations, satellites, that sort of thing. But this panel, I just wanted to focus on the landscapes because that's more than enough for like 40 minutes. Um, we, we tend to get quite passionate about talking about art, so we're yeah. going to try and keep some momentum. Um, and then secondly, we're going to talk about the visual palette. So what I mean about that is, you know, within one system, we want to create a canvas. And within that canvas, we want variety of contrast and all sorts of things. Then we'll move on to the sort of things we've been doing lately, so building out moons from start to finish, and maybe just try and convince you guys that it's not quite easy just yet. Uh, and then we'll move on to our pipeline on tools, you know, how we're we achieving uh, these moons. And then we'll give you a quick demonstration just to give you a little insight. We'll be uh, doing it live. We'll do it live. I was going to say something, but I'm going to keep this clean. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we'll show you the tools, uh, because I think that's quite important, because one of the things about the engine, which is super cool, is you get to do it live, and you get to do it real time. So we'll show you a little bit of that. And then if we get time, we'll hopefully show you a little glimpse about what's coming next. All right, let's get into this. Here we go. So system visual palette. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of these before, but I think it's very important to use as a starting point. So within an entire system, you're going to have a variety of palettes. So what I mean about that is, say, for example, when I'm on Hurston, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I remember what it was like on Alcorp. That felt like that. And when I'm on Alcorp, I'm thinking about Hurston. I'm, when I'm on Crusader, I'm thinking about Microtech. So that's what we want to create, like a, like, a, like a distance. So when you're on a planet or a moon, it's, when you think about another planet that's very far away, it's, it's bringing that space opera to the game. It's not like you can just go from Hurston to Crusader to Alcorp within a couple of minutes, because we want to stretch these guys out. OK. Hurston, I'm sure you've heard about this guy before. Um, we wanted to create something that was uh, very appropriate for Hurston Danox to be in, super polluted. The main landing zone is Lawville. It's pretty much a city covered in ash. There's going to be things like these cultivated gardens, so acro across the landscape, the Hurston executives can go to. Um, we're exploring like the, how the 
biomes around the planet, if it was like heavily polluted, if a corporation showed serious neglect, how would that influence the flora and fauna? Uh, because that's when things start to get quite exciting. Okay, Crusader, big, big gas giant. Um, this is personally going to be my favorite within the Stantum system. I can't wait to get to this. So it's a big floating lattice of platforms. You've got the shipyards and you've got like this landing zone. But what's going to be really interesting is the fact that the Vista is going to be pretty much 90% of what we're going to do there. There's going to be a huge potential for things like weather systems uh, and atmospherics, and then things like dynamic weather. So the way I always describe it is like, imagine I'm Bob there in the, in the, in the lower part of the frame and he's looking out and that weather cloud comes in. So say, for example, you visit there, beautiful sunshine, and maybe next time you visit, you're inside this thick cloud. I start getting the graphics engineers pretty freaked out when I talk <laughs> about being inside clouds. It's fine, they got it covered. Okay, Okop, uh, the usual totally urbanized planet. Uh, but one of the things right now is imagine a day-night cycle on this guy. So we've all seen day-night cycles in games, and it's like, oh, okay, that's sweet. Imagine that on the planet. Um, I nearly swore again then. I'm going to keep this clean. OK, and lastly, Microdeck. So we all know this, terraforming accident. Uh, unusually thick layer of clouds. Again, freaking out the graphics, guys. Uh, lots of possibilities to do with extreme weather uh, and how this will affect the player. All right, so we've been slowly working on this corner of uh, the Stanton system. So we started very, very small. For guys that have been following the game for a while, you know, like slowly we're describing the Stanton system. And as we push forward, we get the ability to describe a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And this has been really great for both the, the team to see, and hopefully you guys as well. So uh, I don't know if you remember, like the first time we showed Selin, I think it was like about a year or two ago, and he was just like a, a textured sphere in the sky dome. That was great. Uh, so if we're going to zoom in on there, this will show you a little bit about what the guys have been working hard on over the last uh, couple of months. So three moons of Crusader. Um, maybe, maybe we just do something like this and say done. Yeah, all good. Uh, actually, that isn't really what we wanted to do because I think even within a small corner of within the system, uh, we wanted to create uh, variety and depth. Um, and also because this is going to be our first showing, of things like our procedural planetary tech and things like that. I wanted something that helped push the tech forward, right? Because if we did something like similar to our own moon, the tech would be good to deliver something like that. Whereas if we start exploring, hey, maybe we do this or maybe we do that, then hopefully it, it's kind of preloading what the tech needs to do uh, a bit further down the line. Okay. So where do we start? I can't go to these guys and say, I want a blue one, I want a red one, it's going to have rainbows. So we always start with law. And so what this means is, it's always like the best starting point for visual design. Uh, it ensures that our ideas sit within like a system tapestry, kind of what we said before. Because if we're working in a corner, I'm like, yeah, we're going to have some blues and reds and whatever, then we'll get to uh, like the rest of the system and we'll just have like skittles, you know, taste the rainbow. Yeah. So you want to sort of balance it stuff out. Sure, you want to balance it out. So, you know, starting with law helps us uh, with that initial starting point. It also means it's a little bit deeper, a little bit less superficial, because if I go to Pascal and I'm like, so we're going to have like blue mountains and we're going to have red rivers, it'd be like, okay, sweet, I'm on it. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, there will be a planet for that. Um, okay, and it also... It's an example of the sort of information of the location. So with law, we get, okay, this location, it has this. It's maybe this type of geology. It's had this sort of history. And then instantly, I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm with it. And then the brain stopped racing. I don't know if you remember this GIF of Baba. I'm sure Dave's talked about this a few times. But who of you has actually seen like the three orbital rings of Crusader's moons in Alasar? Anyone? No? Okay. Maybe that one got missed. All right. <laughs> so a gift for Baba. And, uh, okay, here we go. We're going to move it along. All right, okay. So when we're thinking about, okay, we're going to do these three moons, where do we start? And then we think about what we call biomes, right? And then 
when we start thinking about the biomes, it's all about the details. So first thing we do, we create mood boards. This is the, we've got the law, we've got the location. This is pretty much our briefing. From there, we start doing, you know, we call collecting images. These are quite small for copyright reasons. Uh, but we're just looking around, finding a palette that works. So instantly, you can kind of see the three moons here. And you're starting to see the tapestry sit together. This is the most cost-effective and time-effective way of exploring ideas, because essentially, I'm not going to the guys and saying, hey, man, let's do an ice planet, let's do this. You know, so we can go very, very quickly. Uh, and then this is pretty much the pitch we use toward the discipline. So if I go to the design director and saying, OK, this moon's made out of candy floss. You know, it's kind of soft. He'd be like, maybe, maybe not just yet. OK. Candy floss moon. And stick it in my eye. It's just, it's just on your face. Then. All right, OK, so, this, so we've been up until this point. We've got the law, we've got the location, case set, we've got the briefing. So we've got our corner. Then, then we can start being creative, right? So this is, this is a very, very fun part of the process where we can just you know, get our ideas going. Uh, so until this point, you know, we're kind of defining the box we're going to work in. Um, we use a lot of, we can use anything, right? We photo bias, we do 3D, we sketch. You know, some of the best ideas are from sketching. Yeah, and it's also kind of the part where, um, I mean, when we did the Homestead demo last year, you, we were using the same tech, basically. But we, we got quite confident in getting something really nice looking. But then you get your, your concept art and very, very specific visuals, and you try to hit that target, and you realize, OK, Actually, we never tried this before, and uh, it's not actually working as, as we planned. So then also the R&D comes in again, so it, it, it delays the process a little bit, but improves the tech, so just so we can hit these, um, these concepts or be sure that we can actually go through during development, hitting these targets. Mm. And what we do as well as we're developing these ideas, it's a very intense period of time when all these ideas are coming through. And we get them on the wall, and we put them on our own internal like sharing system, so all developers can kind of see it. So everyone's like checking it, going, "All right, yeah, candy floss moon, that's going to be sweet." All right, okay. So once we've gone through the ideas and it's kind of getting some validation from um, the different discipline directors, and then we're like, "Let's start, let's start honing in." So you know, this is this was a shot that really captured the mood of selling. You know, thin atmosphere. We wanted like a very extreme contrast to it, quite stark. Uh, again, Law said like it's got over a hundred dormant volcanoes, and it's got all these active uh, geysers. That, uh, in fact, trigger the conversation. Is it geysers or geysers? Yeah, a geyser. Yeah. It's no, a we geyser. Still, we still haven't figured that one. So out, there's I all guess. these geysers on selling, right? Um, there, maybe uh, there's a geology expert who can actually. Yeah, if you yeah. help us out on that come one. see me later. All right, OK. And already, um, you know, these ideas start giving like, the different disciplines ideas. Because you know, when we saw these ge geezers, uh, you know, people start saying, OK, well, that like, influence a player. If I stand on a geyser, I'm going to say it different every time. If I stand on one of these guys and it goes off, you know, what's that going to do to me, right? OK, and then we go to yellow. You know, the, the law described as that this thermal frost on it, you know, it's very, very, very cold. Uh, so I was like, all right, OK, ice. And then I went to the director of graphics, Ali, and I was like, we need an ice shader. And he was like, no, we can't do an ice shader yet. So OK, reel it back in. We can't do ice yet, but we will do ice soon. Uh, so again, this part, it's about, it, it's not a, like us just going away and just we're going to do this. It's a collaboration process, right? So instantly, that's how it works. So. Thermal, thermal activity, good. Um, we wanted, as a backup, I wanted a variety of glass. So instead of a moon that's generally quite matte, I wanted something from space. You just see like where it's matte, and you get these nice, beautiful kind of reflections from like a low orbit. Uh, so you'll see that as well. Uh, and then we're thinking about how maybe if if it's like you know when you see in like the Arctic, you see these thermal winds like whipping across the landscape. Imagine if those guys are coming across. Uh, so all of these ideas are coming through, and it's bouncing between like art and design and graphics and back. So it's it's a very creative process. And again, I was like, maybe maybe like Northern Lights, and then just got some just got some 
Sad faces from, from Ali again. Sorry, Ali. Uh, all right, and then we got Daymar. So, you know, it was described as the biggest of the three, so we wanted to do something that's quite thick in terms of atmosphere. Uh, remember what I said before about helping to push that technology forward? So yep. the clever guys in the studio developed this beautiful physically based um, tool for describing atmosphere. So instantly as an artist, I was like, yeah, ramp that up, yeah, make it foggy, that's all good. And again, I got a phone call and okay, we ring it back in. Um, so we made it quite thick uh, because I'm sure when you've seen videos, if you've been upstairs playing it, you know, the way, it the way it interferes with the light, it's really quite beautiful. So seeing how that tech works and it's helped us calibrate it and understand it. So when we get a tool that's physically based and we get like me and rally scatterings, you know, we're just like, mm, my physics isn't so good right now, so I'm playing with value. So it helps us to calibrate the system. Uh, and then just on a slightly subliminal, up until now on Yeller and Selin, all the forms have been coming up. So for this, for Daymar, I wanted all the forms to go down. So that's why you've been seeing things like trenches and ravines. Uh, so on a very subliminal uh, sense, we're changing forms. Again, we're exaggerating variety, even within a corner of a system. Cool. OK. So <clears throat> let me just uh, take this Pass that on. So whenever we, we kick off this progress, uh, process where we get the VTs and start breaking down, OK, how do we actually start building this stuff? Um, there's four levels, major levels of detail that we uh, have to look at. So the first thing would be the global look of the planet. Um, so how does it read from a distance? Can you, for example, on, on Yela, we wanted to have this clear distinction between like frosted areas, um, icy areas, and it has to be visible from a distance. The second part would be what the, what's the actual shape of the terrain? So. Yela and Selen have shapes that go outward, whereas um, Daymar goes down. So all these, these different features, we try to capture them um, in the terrain shapes, and these translate to our ecosystems. And then when we go one step further, we have our scattered objects, all the objects, and um, like the rocks, the, um, the trees that you would find on the surface. And what we try to do is to complement the terrain shapes with these extra scattered elements. Um, there's only inf like there's only a certain amount of uh, details that we can get out of the terrain like the terrain texture and the geometry that we have for the terrain. So anything that's not sharp enough or not crisp enough or not adding enough detail, we add with the, the scattered assets. And then finally, in uh, when you get really close to the surface, we wanted to make sure that this this difference between these locations also translate in the type of materials that you would see. So building an ecosystem. Um, this is something that, that wasn't there on, on planet V1, and maybe uh, Pascal can elaborate. Um, yeah, from V1, I don't know if we actually saw a lot of it. We saw it in one demo, I think. But um, it was very limiting in terms of variety you can create on a planet. So because everything was kind of, it was very procedural. You had very few artistic input um, from what was going on on your planet, and the ecosystem uh, or the V2 technology actually allowed us to have multiple biomes right next to each other. And basically how it works is we have our, basically a big ball in space and there's a, a whole lot of little checkerboards like you see uh, on the top right. You can't see that yet. You can't see that. Oh, fuck. Should I, should I just go to the next there one? There we go. Boom. That's what I'm talking about. So this is basically what an ecosystem is con composed of. I mean, that's, that's a fraction of it, but you have a height map that kind of defines the terrain, how it is displaced. You have a normal map that improves the shading from a distance. And you have this weird color map, which is what we call a splat map. It's kind of a technical map, and we use it for um, where different textures are assigned. So we don't want to have um, mountains with just rocks on it everywhere. We want to be able to say, OK, here we have sand, here we have rock, and here we have uh, grass or whatever. And this is what this map allows us to do. Yep. So this is kind of how one ecosystem is um, set up. And the cool thing is, like these, these same um, textures, they, they're tiling, so we can seamlessly cover the entire surface. But we have different variations, so the way we break up the surface is we have a, like a variety of these, and we just paint them down, and they will blend with each other. We can offset the scale, so they don't always look the same. And that way, we can cover the surface quite fast. 
But the cool thing is these maps also feed into our scattering system, which we will talk about in a little bit, um, where like the splat, cap, uh, splat map colors will determine, like, oh, we put the rocks here, we're going to put sand here, or we're going to have grass. Um, but the height and the, the direction of the normals also helps us uh, give an extra layer of control over where we place our assets. So just to give an uh, example of the three um, the common looks of the, the, the planets like, translated into ecosystems, um, Selen, which is built up of these, these dried up uh, volcanic uh, activity, has all these, these, these mount, mounts that look like they've been like, eroded, like, came up and then just like seeped out and they dried up. It was definitely a, a case where we wanted, we can't have fluid simulations yet. So when we was talking about it, it was a case of like, you know, they've, they've erupted, they've melted, and then they've kind of settled and hardened. Yeah. You know? It was kind of cool uh, to, to get that look, uh, especially when, once we did our first test. We were like, oh my god, this looks like a, a Geiger planet. So we toned it down a little bit, but I think we, we struck a nice balance. Then, uh, like we said, Damar has everything downward, so it's, it's, it's all about canyons and, and dips in the terrain. Um, when you're on the horizon line, you don't see anything peeking out. We really wanted to have this heavy feeling where you go into the planet. QA got a hold of this and just went mental flying through. Yeah, you guys you might, 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 might remember seeing the, the, the yeah. trench run fly through. That gave, gave us a, a bit of a nightmare. It's like, oh, sh didn't expect that to happen. Uh, but it's there, and you can actually do it yourself. So <laughs> then last one would be Yela. And we already described like the, the, this, this ice sheet that's there. You can see from a distance. and. Uh, Everything, like the, the mountain range going up in, in contrast to like the flat areas that are very shiny and icy. So this is what it looks now, but um, I'm going to hand it over to Pascal because we brought some old stuff to sort of uh, explain how, how we got to that point. We kind of figure to, to make the stuff we're doing look, ooh, you know, good. <laughs> Sometimes we've got to show you like where we was, and that'll give you a little bit of a, a barometer reading of just the challenges, you know, the, the mountain that we've had to climb, because if you spin forward to the next slide, it's like, this is where we started with, and it's like, okay, we've got some, we've got some work to do, right? We started much worse, actually. But we didn't bring those pictures, it's not very nice to look at. <laughs> um, basically, what you're looking at is, uh, it's just the bare terrain, it's just a height map. Um, instead of it being completely flat, you have already a bit of definition of the terrain. So this is basically the first thing um, that comes in because it defines the major shapes of your planet. You get a kind of an idea of how it's going to feel in the future. And this is a very early shot um, where things were still in progress in terms of tech. And you can see, I think you can see, it's very blurry. There was a lot of detail missing. Like one, one thing that we always, or is kind of a difficult thing to, to hit is having it look from all, all kinds of distances. So you want to have it look good from space, you want to have it look good when you enter orbit, you want to have it good look, uh, looking good when you're on the surface itself. Mm -hmm. well, one interesting thing to add is like, all games make flat terrain. And the fact that we were able to make terrain that's completely sphere, sphere, spherical and just holds up and works, that's, that's been a challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. So even when we got to that previous slide where it's like, this is terrain and it's like on a sphere and it's, it's, it's connected and it, that was something new completely. Yeah. Uh, brought, it brought its own set of challenges, obviously. Just the idea that you can walk on forever and you'll end up at the same place at some point. A yep. couple of days. It's a very long walk. <laughs> I don't know, we never tried. And then there's a bit of improvement, um, some more detail. We had to add another layer of detail on top. And um, yeah, this is what you see here. And then in the front, you still see it's a little bit of blurriness, like how the textures go into each other, you have like snow going soft into rock. That was the next thing that we had to work on. So you see some early shots of how the terrain was blending. So you, here you see this, this colory map, this flat map doing its work, saying here, is, here we have some soil, rock, snow, whatever. And then we just iterated on how we blend the textures together to get more variety and more variety until you have something, mm. something more nice looking. And uh, in the end, you end up with something like this, and you can have some two completely different ecosystems right next to each other. It was always a constant, almost like a daily conversation, where we'd be just, how do we get more? Because if you look at nature, right? If I 
had like a two by two meter square and I threw it down somewhere. Just within that section, I'd have so much complexity. And then when we're talking about things on a, on a planetary scale, we can't be like, okay, we're gonna go from like, there's a, a little moss and then soil and then grass and then this and buttercups. Like we can't, we, we can't go to that detail yet. So we've got to think about like this global. And then when you saw like those last few slides, which uh, Pascal just showed, you can see like how we've progressed and progressed and progressed. And we've just seen more and more and more um, depth in that scene. And then eventually you just get like these breakthrough moments where you see something like this and you're like, all right, all right. Okay, this is starting to feel quite good now. Yeah, I think this was uh, last year, the start of last year's Homestead, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I think we have to pick up the pace a little bit. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, we haven't seen much variety, well, we, we have quite a variety of rocks on our moons, but then we just wanted to put this in to show you there's also other stuff happening. We have a lot of vegetation coming in now, um, a lot more color. And um, one thing that we do is we, we reuse a lot of assets because like having assets on the whole planet, uh, you cannot make every rock unique, or you cannot do everything from the start mm. again. Yeah, so we, we should try we, to figure out ways of um, we, getting quickly more variation by just reusing assets, but making assigning different materials, getting different look. Yeah. Um, just to show how, how this oh works, yeah. we actually have to play the... So, um, basically, like Pascal said, we cannot build infinite amount of assets. And we try to keep maintainable sets so we can actually increase the quality of the individual assets that we have in the set, instead of just trying to push out as many as possible. So what we try to do is like set it up so we can swap out materials and get a lot of variation and reuse out of that. So this video shows a quick swapping of, um, of the materials, plus an overview of like the asset sets that we have created for 3.0. So there's like different different rock shapes, um, gaugers, I guess, <laughs> uh, plateaus, and like this is all a first pass. And one of the things that we're looking forward to is like getting new shader tech to help increase the quality of these um, rocks as well. Because yeah, yeah. You, usually, what happens is you, you you have like these in, these intense bursts where you trying to figure something out. And you're hitting these brick walls. You're hitting these brick walls. And then you get these, like I said, these eureka moments. And then, then that kind of pushes you into the next set. Yep. And then usually what helps breaking you through to those next levels is, is finding out, you know, how do we all kind of collaborate together to achieve this? And then with everyone's combined hard work, then you go through to the next stage. So another example of the, some of the flow assets that are ready to be used. They're not on the planet yet, but they might be soon. Soon? Yeah. Soon. Look at those baobabs. Those guys are great. Um, you're going to see a little bit of a breakdown later how we go about visually designing our botanicals. We put a lot of work into them. So when I see like these type of asset zoos, I get really excited. And if you look at that guy, there's like it's like if you just go back one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's a bit. Oh, it's a video. But see on the on the right of the, it's like this orange thing. And I think on Gamescom, someone on the stream asked, "What is that guy? Where it came from?" And Chris came to me and was like, okay, these moons are good. Can we add a little bit of flavor? So we did a sprinkling of like unique elements and that's one of the things we found. And he's a really cool guy and smells like hot death apparently. But when you see these things, it just gives a little bit of, a little bit of life to it. And the next step was um, scattering all these assets on the planet, which was, I mean, we figured out the terrain, we figured out how to apply the textures and everything, get a good variety. But still, there's no assets. So in theory, it's still an empty level. Usually, your level is full of assets. So we had to, we moved on to scattering assets. Um, and there's also a very early whip, work in progress from from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and there, it was very basic. We just tried to get assets on there. We tried to figure out a system that works. Um, View distance was always a big problem, like getting things to show up really on very long distance because you have to scatter so many assets because the view distance in this game is ridiculous. Mm. Um, Do you remember when we did this and it was like, we put it on and then we all cheered because we were like, man, we've got a lot of assets on the surface. And then when you look at it and you're like, 
There's no logic involved. To yeah. Yet. And then you start thinking about other problems. So you've, you've, you've kind of pushed through one. You've like, okay, we can now scatter lots of assets. That doesn't freak the programmers out. So it's like, yeah, win. And then you look at it and you're like, right. Because nature does things in a particular way. And as all rise, when you look at things, if something doesn't look natural, it looks wrong. Because you're used to seeing things in a very particular way. But trying to explain, because you're like, OK, this is wrong. And then to some people, it's like, no, we've achieved it. We've scattered assets. But then when you start thinking about how nature works, you start understanding, all right, we need to add complexity to the way we scatter. Or we need tech to maybe integrate these assets a little bit better. So it's always this constant push. You get a breakthrough, and then you're like, you get to get hit by this whole other wave of problems that you never really saw before. Almost constantly hitting the uncanny valley of environment art. I think I say to everyone that we've hired, they're saying, <laughs> no day is easy. You know, if you want to come and work at, at the Foundry or at CIG, you know, every day is going to be hard because nothing that we do is easy. So you've got to be like prepared for that challenge. You've got to, mm -hmm. hey, man, this is a challenge. All right, OK, I'm going to, I'm going to break through that. Um, because that's, you know, you don't come to work for an easy day, right? Yeah. So this is Daymar 3.0, current, current scattering system. That's basically what it looks like now. Yeah. Quite happy. So we just okay. blast through the next ones. Yeah. So um, after we have our terrain shapes, we have our scattered assets. Um, the last part would be the close-up details. Um, since our materials cover a lot of, like, uh, meters and kilometers sometimes, uh, it's, there's a few things that we cannot do. We cannot make really fancy individual textures because they will be spread um, over a large surface. So any specific detail, like a, a very specific twig that's there, it will always show up. So mm -hmm. it was always a bit of a, a struggle to balance that stuff out. Tiling, right? You know, yeah. you, as soon as you put in any type of specific detail, then that specific detail just is gone. You so, know? One of the things we tried was uh, using uh, just scanned data because you don't have to build it. You can just grab from libraries. And what, what it turned out to be is like it wasn't very usable for us because we needed a lot of control uh, to simplify it and have a clean material read. But we do, what we do now is actually we use chunks of scanned data for uh, height maps and we sample like color values and um, all the PBR values from scanned resources. And then we compile that into our own materials. So this is a quick setup of, of how, we, um, how we do our typical materials. We have scanned uh, height information that feeds into our textures, um, basically the shapes of the rock. Then we have a couple of nodes with different sand types that are based on PBR values. And we can just basically toggle between them if we want to make a red sand or a brown sand. Same for the, um, for the rock types. And the way this graph is set up is it allows us to quickly like uh, determine like, oh, we're going to use a very, very rocky ground or uh, almost no rocks. We want to scale them up. We want to have bumpy ground. And the sliders and all these controls are basically in this graph, but we don't tweak any of the, the physical values of these materials. Um, so with this system, we managed to kick off like a, a set of materials for each location that is physically correct. Um, it looks cool, and it was like, easy to control. Uh, how much information was in each texture. So the, um, the dusty, more moon-like um, textures for Selen with some dried lava flow. Um, the Daymar palette, which is a bit more based on uh, the Earth Sahara. And um, the Yela palette, with head, which one of the cool things about Yela, I think, is because it's completely, it has this frosty look. There's no loose soil uh, flowing around. Everything is sort of stuck in place, something that we wanted to represent in the materials as well. And I think these materials, when you get really up close, is like the last step on top of all this variation that we tried to create between these different locations. But when we kicked off uh, with the materials, we only had like one material over a very large area. And you can sort of see, like if you would land here, it would, would feel very barren. And it's like, OK, well, this is it. People bragging about planets, and you get there, and then it's like, this is what you see. Um, it's not making us happy. It's not making you guys happy. So with these new palettes and the way we blend uh, all this stuff together, this is closer to what we have now. This is actually what we have now. So the palette of, of Selen coming together, you see the breakup between like, the more dense um, uh, rock ground, the, um, the more dusty sand, 
the one for Daymar, and uh, the one for uh, Yela. And there was a happy accident with our blending on Yela because there was no eye shader. But sometimes you hit these, these happy accidents um, because we had soft blending between the materials. And if you look closely, you, you can sort of see underneath the ice layer, you can sort of still see the, the soil underneath. And it gave this nice frosted over look and it almost made this ice look transparent. So there was a, a happy accident, but we'll take it until we have like a proper ice shader. Um, and that will be coming at, at some point. <laughs> yeah, Bob Ross came in that day and we had a happy accident. <laughs> all right, okay, so once we've been doing all of this process, um, the tech's been advancing, the assets have been advancing, it gains us momentum. And before we can actually release and validate the final frame, it's a perfect opportunity to just do some quick paint overs because what happens is as everyone's developing, everyone's kind of gets laser focused on one thing because as Michelle's saying, it's like, I'm making my shader and this is looking good. And Pascal's like, I'm doing my distribution system and this is good. But it's my job, I've got to make sure that we all put our art glasses on and we kind of validate the frame looks good. And what we do is we paint over and we make sure that we highlight stuff that's missing. And we kind of just say, again, you know, here's the things that we're still missing, you know, and it might be something that we introduce for that release or it goes on the tech backlog of this is what we want to do in the future. So we do paint overs and we kind of really get the look and feel right. And, you know, the lighting team looks at this, the VFX team looks at this, and the art team, design team. And again, we just kind of align everyone back into that palette. So this is for th things like selling, and then we sketch over, okay, we break down, okay, these are the things we're missing. So if you think back about that scattering, you look back at, okay, what does nature do? And then when you understand what nature does, then indirectly that informs how we're going to need to do it. I mean, yeah. irrelevant whether it's on a small scale or a large scale, we always have to go back to nature because as a player, you guys will be playing it and you'll be like, wait a minute, this something's not right. Because any type of distribution system, if it's based on the algorithm or if it's based on logic, you're going to see repetition. Like there's no system that's, that's perfect, right? And it's, it's quite easy to get lost in the tools. You're yes. Just, you're just building stuff and you're putting st more stuff on the planet and you walk around and it's like, whoa, this looks cool. Yeah. And you have to look back every once in a while to, to how nature does it. There's sometimes arguments. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes you've got to really evaluate what we're doing because, you know, you might say, hey, we've ticked these boxes, we're doing it. But then we always need to push forward. And this is something that we're going to keep doing and doing and doing and doing until, you know, um, we're all finished and happy. So again, yellow, uh, different things happening there. So we're describing what materials do, you know, what atmospheric conditions can kind of happen. And again, with Daemon. Tends to come back to very specific things. You know, how do, how do shaders react under these uh, kind of like physical conditions? How do objects get distributed? How do, if a, if a piece of rock was in a desert for 20 years, what would it look like? You know, how do we make our shaders react to that. And usually what happens when we start breaking it down, we're like, okay, it doesn't do this, doesn't do this, doesn't do this. So it starts driving that tech forward, right? Okay, final, final implementation. So this is just like snapshots of where we're at. So this is what the, the current 3.0 build is like now. Uh, it's been a very um, engaging process between multiple disciplines and kind of going back to what I was saying to at the start, it's, it's hard, right? You know, this is, this is crazy, this sort of things we're doing. It's never been done before. But everyone has to come to work charged. They'll get knocked down. They'll hit with problems. They go home and just think, man. But they could always come in the next day, and we always try and figure it out. So something like Talon, you know, that, that tight, high contrast vibe. Something like Yella and Dema, all good. So. I think uh, everyone uh, that's on the team is super happy with what we've managed to achieve, even though we're just describing that small corner of, uh, of, of the system. So, Santon system, right? It's a corporate business part based on law. Actually, I like to think about it, it's the building ground for our pipeline and tools. So what I mean by that is, you know, this is the challenge we're facing on working in this corner but we can't go through all of these systems, figuring out, figuring out, figuring out. So we, we see the Santon system, it's where we build our tools, we build our, our pipeline, and then once we get that solid foundation, that's gonna empower the art team, 
and the various other sort of disciplines to just create, right? So without that solid foundation, you can't really go off, right? Need to recharge. Okay, how does the sausage get made? We're just going to little switch out. So that says one minute, 33 seconds left. Yeah, that's not a lot of time. Um, so one minute, 33 maybe some seconds. of you guys recognize this. This is Daymore. We're here in the sandbox. Um, this is basically what we work with. Um, and for, for uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit yet, how, or, or a little bit of the tools. Um, mostly Sorry, just let's do that one more time. In and out, one more time. In and out. In real time. I, I, can't, I can't describe to you how, <laughs> how cool that is, right? And like, working, working on this stuff and, and seeing it happen uh, for the first time, it, it would take a good couple of weeks, if not months, to get your head around like, the amount of space that you actually have to, to work on. And we have really good tools, but at the same time, it's... Uh, yeah. Just go in and out, man. That's all we need to show. We should have started <laughs> with it. That's all we need to show, right? That's and if you I... actually go inside that outpost, it's not just the organics, but the way we place our point of interest, it's all there. You know, you could fly in there if you want. But anyway, Pascal's going to do his thing, right? Maybe just do a quick uh, eco swap. I don't know what's going to go on in 20 seconds. Know, okay, I'm just like going to ruin this planet a little bit for you guys. <laughs> so basically, what a planet looks like in the beginning is like this. There's really nothing going on. There's just a whole lot of emptiness um, with just one big texture on it. And then we start to bring in these ecosystems. This is kind of what you saw earlier on the, on the shots. Um, draw in your height maps. Oops. Now you can see a whole lot of repetition. So this is basically one ecosystem repeating itself without any procedural randomization. And it's also pretty flat. Get a, uh, Magic numbers he's typing in right now. Do you want to bring that over to the main screen? Just bring that tool over. Do you want to? Oh, yeah. This yeah. is basically the tool that we work with. Um, this is called the Planet Editor. There's a whole lot of numbers and stuff. Not very interesting to look at, but that's basically what we work in all of the time. But yeah. We get the visuals over here, so that's uh, quite gratifying. Yeah. And then, basically, from this height map information, we go over to a textured version. We get something like this. We have all our textures on there, all the materials, but still, it's very empty. You, have, you still have the particles in the preset. And then, basically, the, the last iteration that we do is getting all of the uh, assets back in there. And you end up with something like this. Now, this is just a couple of seconds. It actually takes quite some time to <laughs> do all this. He's done this it is in basically uh, 20 the seconds. End result. Done. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and there you have Daymar. Easy. Easy mode. Yeah. Done. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Easy. We're already in overtime. All right. So we've got, um, do you want to switch out? We've got one minute, 37 seconds. No way, that's going no, up it's, now. It's no, we're already counting up now. So we've got extra Do time. we still want to tease? Okay, let's blast back to the, the PowerPoint and we'll right. go from there. Okay, sausage got made. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm going to blast through this and we can get to some questions, right? So what else is coming? So we're showing how we've been working, building our tools, what we're all excited to move on to. So things like the Iron Halo. So this is this impassable hard to navigate section. Um, I thought it'd be really cool if we had these very formal gateway sections so you kind of knew that you was going to get into something and you think, really, am I going to get into this? Districts of Lowville, we've all seen Lowville, but how do we describe this polluted cityscape, uh, particularly in between, like, where there's this, uh, the big building of the, the family? How does that sit around all of this uh, all of the cityscape around him, suffering that we've been working hard to get that scale read, right? Because that guy, uh, that building's pretty big. It's huge. Uh, and then things like, you know, what type of ecosystems are going to be on that planet? It's a corporation run amok, so they'd have these huge dumping grounds, and then this starts informing, informing like, the assets we're going to need, but also 
type of animals, check that armadillo out, he's sweet, moving on. Uh, and then things like when we go to um, Microtech. Microtech, you know, the domes of New Babbage, that's going to be cool. But then also like the headquarters, you know, um, they're a very high tech company, you know, what would the uh, headquarters be like? And then we wanted a very good contrast between this slick uh, high tech kind of dome but with some botanicals in there. So we started getting some ideas. So you've got this very monotone landscape outside. So how do we, we've got like white mountains outside and we've got like white walls inside. You know, where's the color coming from, right? The uh, Todd's always going, where's the color in the game? So I'm like, here's the color. So what would happen is um, you'd have this high tech company that make these beautiful products. What type of uh, what type of botanicals would they have in there? So then we're like, all right, okay, they wouldn't have like dried, like a dried fern in there. So they'd be like, okay, we, we know a bit about technology. So they almost... Maybe we should help the plants a little bit. Help the plants a little bit. So then it was like, maybe there's like a type of bioweave in there. So anyway, we get into this crazy detail. So every botanical that you see in our game goes through this very uh, rigid uh, visual development process where we're wondering what that, what that guy is. And if you think about on the outside of that dome, if you've been inside this calm interior of uh, New Babbage, then on the outside, you're just going to get blasted, right? Because this was a terraforming accident. So this, this, this landscape's wild. And then again, the botanicals. What would the botanicals have been like if they would have been blasted since you know, every day they were grown, so everything would be leaning? So it'd be kind of cool as if you're going across the landscape, everything's just uh, to kind of one side. And then going to my personal favorite, like Arzen, the floating landscapes, we've, we, the floating lattice, we've seen this. But then how do we push that further forward? So within the Stanton system, okay, you've got Hurston Dynamics, I've been there and polluted, all that sort of thing. I've gone to Arcorp, it's Perpetual City, I've gone to, I've gone to Microtech, I'm gonna get blasted right. I wanted somewhere where there's a little bit of, um, a, little bit of a nice landscape to kind of relax in. So from the law, you know, it's more about the recreation. So I was thinking it'd be beautiful to have like these gardens overlooking these vistas and then flags because I love flags, but also because I wanted to build it um, like a subliminal palette. So say for example, you're in um, Pyro system on a base and you're having a good time. And then occasionally you'll see like this logo of this top corner. And if you see, it's like a triangle with these um, three triangles within it. And that reflects to how the gardens are, you know, how the architecture, how these seats are arranged. And you look at that and you go, man, I want to go to Crusader again. But it's not going to be that quick journey. So again, we're extending the palette so it feels a bit more like a space opera. So if you wanted to go from system to system, that's going to take a long time, right? And again, trees. You know, we've got a trees on Crusader. What would it be like if they grew up like high up above a gas giant? You know, I wanted something that didn't feel like a bonsai, but almost felt just as beautiful, just from a pure silhouette. And again, the cloud layer, if you look at the canopy on this, it almost reflects the, the, the kind of shape language that you get in a particular type of clouds. All right, um, we're six minutes over. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before oh, yes. questions. Uh, we're running a little short on time, so I'm not sure how much Q&A we'll have. Um, before we got into questions, though, I wanted to introduce Andy Green to the stage, if you can come on up. He is the uh, CEO of Acme Atronomatic, the makers of the My Radar app. Andy and, uh, Andy and his company are in the process of using our planets in a way that we didn't really intend, so... He's going to talk for a bit on what they're doing. Thank you, Brian. So as Brian said, my name is Andy Green. I am a huge fan of Star Citizen. I've been a backer since the beginning in 2012. And um, I'm a firm believer in Chris's vision of the game. But during my day job, I'm the CEO of a company called Acme Atronomatic. And among other things, we make a cool mobile weather app called MyRadar. So it's fairly popular in the States. Uh, we've got about 10 million active users and the app has been around since 2008. Um, over the years, we've gotten very good at uh, visualizing all sorts of weather and weather-related data, and in displaying that data on maps. And uh, we've even spread out a bit in that we're now able to 
uh, show NASA satellite imagery for other planetary bodies like Mars, giving users a, a new way to view the red planet. So one day in this epiphany of nerddom, I thought to myself, how cool would it be if we could use this technology to render virtual worlds? So earlier in the year, um, being such a big Star Citizen fan, I reached out to CIG to see if they were interested in experimenting. And uh, they thought the idea sounded cool. So with a little bit of help from them, we took the high resolution data for their procedurally generated moons. Um, we massaged and uh, molded the data a little bit and put it into a format we could use. And we now have the ability to display the moons of Star Citizen Alpha 3.0 within the MyRadar app. That is cool. That is cool. So users can pan around the globe and zoom in to see specific landscape and uh, geographical features of the moon. And you can get in close enough to see the ice sheets of Yella and the deep canyons of Damar. Uh, the detail is even good enough that if you find an ideal crater, you can park and hide your reclaimer in it. Uh, there's also a details section you can pull down that reveals additional information on each moon, including its uh, atmospheric composition, atmospheric pressure, uh, the details of its orbit, um, the actual size of the moon itself, as well as some other interesting facts. So, with this collaboration, MyRadar gives players the chance to get an early exploratory look at the three moons of Crusader. And if you make sure you've got the latest version of MyRadar, uh, the Star Citizen features can be accessed today with a free download, and it's available now on both Google Play and uh, the Apple App Store. Thanks. Awesome, thanks Andy. Yeah, like I said, we, we didn't originally uh, have this intent in mind, but it's awesome you're able to grab that and, and work with us and do that. So, unfortunately, with us running a little bit late, we don't have time for Q&A, um, but I'll make sure that I kick these guys out from backstage, out to the floor, so feel free to find them and ask more questions. Um, we'll be back in five, ten minutes with the Consolidated Outland Pioneer presentation, and that's going to be pretty cool. So, see you in a bit.